First of all, I want to thank Kara and, and, and Derek for the opportunity to come here and talk today. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the grain supply chain and uh, what we do to measure it. Um, in, uh, in short, I'll talk, you, talk to you a little bit about what the grain monitoring program is and where it came from. Uh, the Western Grain Handling and Transportation System basically lay out what the playing field looks like. And then I'll talk about the processes of, of what we measure and how we gather the data. And I'm going to try to get through that really quickly because I'm, then we want to talk about what does the data actually tell us and, and why we have to look at it the way that we do. <clears throat> but first of all, um, a little bit of background about how we ended up getting the job that we have. Uh, if you went back into the 1990s, uh, the, the federal government had uh, a, an organization in place that was called the Grain Transportation Agency. And under the Grain Transportation Agency, they did allocation of hopper cars for the movement of grain in Western Canada. Well, in 95, they disbanded that. And then in the uh, winter of 1996-1997, uh, the system pretty much fell apart. What followed that was the uh, S Day Commission, uh, which examined how the grain supply chain worked at the time. It was followed up by uh, uh, working groups that were led by a former assistant deputy minister named Arthur Kruger. And what came out of that was a series of recommendations that included the establishment of an independent monitor of the grain handling and transportation system. Uh, those reforms went into place in 2000, and in 2001, we were the lucky uh, recipient of the contract. And so since June of 2001, uh, the company that uh, we'd started in 1999 became the Grain Monitor. And that's pretty much all that we do. There's four of us who are dedicated to managing the program, which is collecting data from all sorts of data, data points and putting them in place. Uh, we are basically a transportation consulting firm. We're uh, kind of a group of ex-railroaders, ex-transportation types, uh, a couple of people out of the grain industry now, and that's what we do is we collect the data, we assess it, and we put out our, our uh, analysis in a weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual reports, and then we come out and we talk to all sorts of stakeholder groups right across the country throughout the year. It's a good gig. Um, so what do we do? We, we collect data on infrastructure. We measure the, the, the movement of grain from the farm gate to the time that it either leaves the port or it's delivered to its final destination. Um, in 2014, it was expanded to, uh, to go to weekly and monthly reports. We also started measuring and monitoring the movement of grain into the United States and into Eastern Canada, and then from, Eastern, uh, from the United States into Western and Eastern Canada. It's used very broadly. Um, I know a lot of the people in this room use it. We, uh, sub we pu publish all of the data on our website, but it gets used by people in government, both federal and provincial municipal governments, um, industry organization. I think our stakeholder community is well over 100 different entities. Um, we, we also have done a number of supplemental studies over the years. We've, we've looked at everything from the trucking of grain to movement in containers. And then uh, in, in a couple of instances, we've done some very detailed work for the federal government. First, uh, we did all of the analytical work for the Rail Freight Service Review in 2008, 2009. And we also just recently published uh, an, another report on the entire grain supply chain. That was uh, actually work that was done in 2011 and 12, but uh, for whatever reason, the, the government didn't want to have it released until just last year. So what is the playing field? Um, Western Canadian grain represents about 85 to 90 percent of all of the grain that's grown in, in Canada. It has a, a, a value of well over 20 billion dollars. Uh, I think probably in the last couple of years that stretched up to about 30 billion. And it goes to over a thousand destinations all over the globe. So 
What does it look like? Well, there's about 30,000 farms out in Western Canada, uh, ranging from small ones that are 1,000 acres up to some people who have 10,000 acres or more. It is delivered into 382 primary and process elevators in the West. It goes by two major railways, CN and CP, with 17,000 miles of track all over Western Canada. 95% of all of the grain that is, is put out for export in Canada, or in Western Canada, has to go by rail, because it's the only economic uh, means by getting it there. It goes to 17 port uh, terminals, and four Western ports in about 11 uh, different areas in Eastern Canada. Um, there's also eight container terminals in Canada that are handling grain in containers. And we load, or we, this country loads over 1,500 ocean vessels with grain every year. Some of the things that make this important, like why, why is it important uh, to measure the supply chain or the transportation and the logistics of grain? I think first uh, and, and most primarily, transportation and logistics represents about 25% of the FOB cost at port um, of grain. So it is a big, big cost component. And if it's not managed properly, it can get out of control. But more particularly, why is it that Canada should be concerned about this? But when you, so because when you compare us to other countries, we probably have the longest length of haul to get it to port position. Secondly, we have a huge dependent dependency on, on exports as compared to our competitor countries. The United States probably only exports about 20% of what they grow. We export over 55% of what we grow, and, it, and it's actually growing. In the last three years, that number is probably getting north of 60%. And on top of that, Canada has probably some of the harshest climate and geography to move grain between where it's grown and where it goes to export. One in particular is the Rocky Mountains. So let's talk about the supply chain and what do we measure? We measure from the time it leaves the farm gate to the time it goes to the shipping line. So basically that is what our mandate is. We, we, we look at what moves in trucks, all the way to the time that it gets loaded in a vessel or port, or, and most recently, when it gets delivered to a destination in the United States. We measure production and supply. Um, Statistics Canada is probably our best supplier for most of that information, although we do gather some from the Canadian Green Commission directly. Um, and these are just volume statistics. And it's the same with the traffic and movement data that we, that we look at. We look at how much uh, rail movement, how much flows through the country elevator system, how much flows through the port system, and at a detailed level, we look at how much gets loaded to the vessels. We also monitor and track all of the infrastructure in Western Canada, including all the elevators, the rail lines, the port terminals, and, and how that is changing over time. Um, commercial relations, we, we track rates. Uh, we track rates that the grain companies charge producers and other companies for the elevation of grain in the country. We also track what the rail freight rates are. And we've been doing all of this since the beginning. Um, probably one of the most interesting parts of what we do is taking all of that data and looking at it from a performance perspective. How well is the system per performing? This is something that really came in handy when we got to 2013-14 because you could see how all of the other issues around it started to affect the total system's performance. And we look at that and that's probably our biggest section of, of measures. Last but not least, we look at how does it impact the uh, producer. And, and that, those measures are primarily monetary measures. We look at how, how the uh, the net back to the producer is affected year over year by all of the costs that are associated. So really quickly running through each one of these se sections, uh, 
we, we look at production and supply, basically everything that happens on the farm, but probably the, most, the number that's most important to us is not so much just the production number, we look at supply, because supply is representative of what there is that has to move in any given year. So we're also concerned about what the carryout stocks are. In the traffic and movement section, we look at country elevator throughput, we look at what goes through by rail, and we look at it on a commodity basis, and we also look at it on a corridor basis. We look at how much went through the terminal elevators um, and how much got loaded to vessels and when it got loaded to vessels. Plus the truck volumes into the United States was something that we started in 2014 and we took that all the way back to 2012 because we wanted to see uh, one thing in particular that we wanted to see is that when the Canadian Wheat Board monopoly was removed, we wanted to see how that affected the movement of, of uh, traffic to the United States by truck. We track all of the uh, infrastructure between the country and the uh, port terminals. We also track, as I said, commercial relations. Um, our trucking rate data, I'll, I'll confess right now, isn't very, very good. All of the rest of it we have a high degree of confidence in. Now, system efficiency and performance, as I said, these are, are uh, things that we, we really spend a lot of time at trying to understand and developing these numbers in a way that are uh, relatable. Um, we look at the country elevator storage times, we look at car cycles and transit times of the railways, we look at it by corridor at a very, very uh, detailed level. <clears throat> we look at car block sizes because that is in, a, uh, in effect, um, implicates itself in what the cost is and what the efficiency of the railways has been over, over time. Terminal elevator storage times, uh, one important statistic that we look at, um, not so much in the general public, is, is the stock to shipment times. Um, terminal at a car time is, is a recent measure that we put in place that we feel is quite important. Vessel lineups. Um, how many vessels are, late, are sitting in port and how long they've been sitting there. Uh, another very important one is how many times does a vessel have to stop to, to load. Does, very few vessels actually get their full load in one stop or one berthing. And vessel demurrage and dispatch is also a very important number because it's a cost that always ends up getting fed back to the producer. And of course, Last but not least, as I said, producer impact is a, is a number that we look at very carefully. We only publish that one uh, on an annual basis, but the uh, producer car loadings we track on a monthly basis. So where do we get our data? Well, we have 49 individual data providers, and it ranges from grain companies. Uh, a lot of it we get through the CGC, some direct from grain companies. We get it from all of the railways uh, directly. Stats Canada, of course. Uh, terminal elevators feed us information, as well as different marine-related organizations, ranging from the Coast Guard to the BC Maritime Employers Association to shipping agents. We have confidentially, confidentiality agreements with just about everybody. Um, when we started the program, there was a lot of nervousness within the industry about what was going to happen to the data, so we signed these agreements. It is all held securely in our, our uh, office. We get the data in all sorts of different manners. Everything from handwritten sheets that are faxed into our office on a daily basis to FTP transmissions. Um, we, we get data from people daily, monthly, weekly, and some of it on an annual basis. It depends on what the type is. That is a very short list of our major stakeholders in, our, in the stakeholder community. These are people that we talk to on a regular basis, which is kind of what makes the job fun, because we get to talk to most of the players in the industry. So what is the timing of the measures? 
Well, on a daily basis, we're always looking at what the unloads were from the previous day. We look at how much gets loaded to vessels. We're looking at how well are the terminals being utilized, what is the kind of labor that goes to the, to the uh, vessels, and how many vessels are waiting at each port on every day. We track that on an ongoing basis. Now, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, and an annual basis, you can see in the matrix there, what are we following? Um, but those are all the activities that we're tracking on a regular basis. So, that's pretty much what we collect and how we do it. But what is it telling us? And this is kind of, this is the results of it. Now, if you look at this, this is our total supply picture. If you look at this over the uh, 17 years that we've been tracking, you can see the last four years have been a remarkable change. Um, when, when the crop of 2013 came out, everybody said, well, that's an, an anomaly. Um, I think probably what we found is a new normal. And, you know, in the, in the first 10 to 12 years of the grain monitoring program, we saw anywhere between half to 1% one, 1 annual growth. Uh, these last four years have boosted that up to sometimes four or five. And I think this is probably where we're going in the future. And this is why it's important to keep tracking uh, how, the, how the supply chain and how the transportation and logistics system is working in the movement of grain, is because it just puts more and more stress on the system. Shipments from country elevators, again, you can see what's happened in the last three years. It's, it's really, really started to, to boom. Where is it going? Well, 76% or three quarters of it is all getting shipped to ports in Western Canada. 6% is going into Eastern Canada and the US uh, rail and truck movement is starting to creep up close to 20%. And that's interesting, and I'll talk about that in a second, but when we started the grain monitoring program, less than 5% of Western grain went into the United States. And this is how it's grown in that period of time. The Western Canadian traffic, well, the single biggest port in, Western, er, in Canada is Vancouver, and it's no different for, for grain. Um, the, the grain system in Canada is highly dependent on the port of Vancouver. There's six terminals there, uh, soon to be seven, and they, they're working just about 24-7. For instance, this Christmas, probably for the first time in, in anyone's memory, they only took one day off. They took Christmas Day, and then they took New Year's Day. They worked 24-7 the rest of the time. The biggest growth that we've seen in Canada again is on the west coast. You can see how much we've exported through the ports. Um, the, the vast majority of what that growth represented came through the ports of Vancouver and Prince Rupert. We set records in the last three years, every year, and every year beating the year before. This, might, this year might not make it quite, but it'll be pretty close to what we moved last year. Another big issue that, uh, well, it's not an issue, I think it's probably a positive note. When we started the grain monitoring program, we would see anywhere between 75 and 82% of all of the grain was cereal grains that were being handled by the Canadian Wheat Board. If you look at just the last five years and what that diversity change has meant, is that you, you see a very, very uh, large increase in the amount of canola that's moved, but you also see a big increase in the amount of special crops, predominantly pulses. Um, they, they make up a more diverse mix of traffic, and what that brings with it is a greater amount of stability. I talked about movement into the United States, and one of the reasons that we really thought it was important to track some of the trucking volumes is in the year before the CWB's monopoly was removed, it was just under two million tons. And in 2014-15, that amount had grown to 3.2 million tons, and that was just moving by truck. When you add the uh, rail movement, um, 
that was getting up close to 9 million tons moving into the United States. How has the infrastructure changed? Uh, when we started monitoring the grain handling transportation system, there was over 1,000 elevators in 685 different communities across Western Canada. Now we're down to 382, and it's only in 269 communities. Um, I can remember going out into the country in 2002, 2003, and to a lot of the towns that have since lost their elevators, and when I go through there in the last year and a half, some of those towns have totally disappeared. So not only has this, this had an, a, a big change on, on how grain moves in the country, it's had a social implication as well, and I think that's just as important for people to recognize. Capacity in the country is, is another um, interesting statistic. You can see how um, the, the red line there is the number of uh, stations that are out there. The gold line is the number of facilities. But probably more important is the amount of storage capacity that's out in the system. Now, right up until about 2004, the, the storage capacity number kind of tracked that all the way down. But what we've seen is a, an incredible change in the type of elevators that are out in the country, and that's indicative in the storage capacity. Um, they're building more and more big concrete terminal elevators out in the country, and we're back up to uh, three years ago. We passed what the storage capacity was in 1999, and we're really creeping up fast on 8 million tons worth of capacity in the country for receiving grain. What does the rail network look like? Well, I put the picture of 1980 up there for, for a good reason, because what you saw out there was a spider web of, of both CN and CP across the three prairie provinces that kind of looked like it was a really, really interesting competitive network. But you look at it today, and it's quite sparse. And in that period of time, they've taken out about 7,000 miles of track most of it branch line. But the other thing that's very distinguishing about that picture is the fact that now what you have is CN predominantly on the north side of the prairies, CP predominantly on the south side of the prairies. And that, that really changes the competitive makeup of the way that the system looks today and the way that it operates. One of the key measures at the, you know, at the end of the day after you've measured how much time is in the system is how much, does it, how much time does it spend in store in the country, how long does it take the railway to get it to port, and how long does it sit at the port. And again, you go back to 2001, 2002, the, the average amount of time back then was about 70 days. And in the last five years, that number has come down to about 42. And, it, and that's an important number to recognize as well because Every time you take a day out of the movement of grain or a day out of the amount of time that, that, that is in the possession of the people who are moving it, you're basically saving about $2 million in cash cost alone. Um, not to mention how much more efficiently all of the assets get utilized. So the amount of time that grain spends in the system is really important. You can also see a lot of in improvements in the efficiency of both the country and elevator, uh, terminal elevator utilization. Um, as you can see, we've gone from uh, turning terminal elevators about five and a half times in a year to well over 18 times in a year. Um, this is not only a function of volume, but it's also a function of efficiency and use. Rail car cycles have dropped. Um, in my railway days, uh, if we got 22-day car cycles, we thought we were doing really, really good. Well, today, car cycles are between 12 and 14 days. That's, that's another indication of the efficiency of the railway system. But what's kind of driving some of these numbers, again, you can see loaded transit time has really dropped in the last three years. But the railway block size, um, if you went back uh, 
even, even 15 years, it was not un unusual to see blocks of cars of 10 to 18. Um, today, well over 85% of all of the grain that moves out of the country is moving in a unit train. Um, I'm going to skip by this, except to say that those are the government hopper car fleets. And, and we've been tracking that since the beginning as well. It hit a high of over 18,000 cars in 1985. In 2016, it's just over 13,800 government cars out there. Um, and that fleet is starting to get old, decrepit, falling apart, um, and it's also wearing out its useful life. Um, those cars will be out of service by about 2036. It's not, a, it's not something to get panicked about, but it's something to keep in the front of people's mind. Vessel lineups, just in the last 12 months, some of the things that we've been tracking, it hit a high of 30 back in uh, January of last year. It's come down quite a bit, but in the last few weeks, we're back up there, and this is thing, these are things that concern us. Number of days in port, if you uh, look at it over the last three years, We've had some periods back in 2014 where vessels were waiting for grain up to 36 days. And, and that is, that, that's on average. There were some vessels out there that waited almost two months looking for grain. That was part of the crisis that occurred in 2013-14. Now we're down to about eight or nine, which is normal, but in the last few months it's creeping up again. What caused that? Well, probably one of the biggest one was the fact that ocean freight rates de decrease to record low levels. Um, you can get a Panamax vessel for about $5,000 a day right now, but a normal price would be around $20,000. Multiple births have pretty much stayed the same. We expected that was going to change with the CWB uh, removal, but it didn't happen. Out of car time uh, is something that we measure on a frequent basis. It basically says how well the uh, manpower in the terminals are being used. So what has it told us? We've seen huge changes in the playing field. The infrastructure, the processes have been uh, mostly positive and, and it's a better system today. Uh, the 2015-16 movement was probably one of the best that we've seen in the time that we've been monitoring grain from all perspectives, volume and performance. And so far, this crop year is going pretty good. There's been some, some issues, um, but the improvement in the communication between grain companies, producers, and the railways has probably improved dramatically since what we saw in 2013-14. There's still some challenges with car allocation, but uh, I think we'll overcome those. So in closing, uh, what we've collected is 17 years worth of detailed data. Uh, we strive to remain neutral in our assessments and, and what we say about how the system works, but sometimes you've got to call it as you see it. Um, and, I and I would point to the fact that if you're interested in any of this data, you'll find it on our website. And we always welcome uh, questions. And, it, and my, my line at the bottom there is, is that and this is true, some of the best analysis that we've done in the past comes from questions that we never thought to ask ourselves. So we really encourage people to ask questions. And uh, at that point in time, I'll say thank you. That's our website. Uh, it's easy to remember. And so if you're looking for any of our data, you'll find it on Excel spreadsheets on our website. Thank you.